Self-Mastery Emile Kuhl Introduction In this manual, Emile Kuhl, a French pharmacist of the first half of the 20th century, teaches us how to gain power through autosuggestion. He is a pioneer of the new thought, and has been quoted and plagiarized for almost a century. Hundreds of works have presented his ideas with small variations, or sometimes not so much. In particular his famous phrase, every day, from every point of view, I am getting better and better. This phrase appears in different self-help books, and even forms part of the lyrics of a song by John Lennon, Beautiful Boy. Some concepts may sound old-fashioned, but with a little goodwill and willingness to learn, one can overlook them, or translate them into contemporary terms. Then you can take the rich teachings, and begin to apply them immediately. There is much repetition in the text, but it is a way of looking at these ideas, which even today may sound advanced, from various angles in different contexts. I enthusiastically invite the reader to study and put into practice these valuable teachings, which will surely modify all areas of your daily life, where they are applied. Chapter 1. The Method. Suggestion, or rather auto-suggestion, is a recent subject, but as old as the world. It is a new subject in the sense that, up to the present, it has been little studied and, consequently, little known. It is ancient, because it dates from the moment man appeared on earth. Autosuggestion, in fact, is an instrument that we possess at birth, and this instrument, or rather this force, is endowed with an unprecedented and incalculable power, so that, according to the circumstances, it will produce the best or the worst effects. The knowledge of this force is not only useful for each one of us in general, but in particular it is indispensable for doctors, magistrates, lawyers, youth educators, parents, etc. When it is consciously put into practice, it avoids, in principle, provoking in others auto-suggestions which, because they are harmful, can lead to disasters. And on the other hand, it can with the conscious use of the same, provoke goods that bring physical health to the sick, moral health to the neurotic, unconscious victims of previous auto-suggestions, and above all to people, who have a tendency to mix with the unpleasant. The Conscious Being and the Unconscious Being In order to understand the phenomena of suggestion or, to speak more precisely, of auto-suggestion, it is necessary to know that in us, there are two individuals, absolutely distinct from each other. Both are intelligent, but while one is conscious, the other is unconscious. This unconscious state is the reason why the existence of this being generally goes unnoticed. However, it is easy to verify this existence, if one takes the trouble to examine certain phenomena and to reflect on them for a few moments. Here are a few examples. Everyone is familiar with somnambulism, we know that a somnambulist gets up at night without waking, that he leaves his room after dressing, goes downstairs, crosses corridors and, after performing certain acts or finishing certain works, returns to his room, and goes to bed again. In the morning he shows his greatest surprise, when he wakes up, he finds finished, a work that he had left unfinished the day before. He does not know that it was he who did it. What force does his body obey but an unconscious force, his unconscious being? Let us now consider, if you will, the very frequent case of an alcoholic, attacked by, delirium tremens. As a prey of an attack of madness, he takes any weapon, a knife, axe or hammer, and hits furiously those who have the misfortune to be around him. When the access is over, the man comes to himself, contemplates with horror the massacre that is offered to his sight, without knowing that he himself is the author. Is it not the unconscious that has ordered this discomfort? If we compare the conscious being with the unconscious being, we find that, while the conscious being is endowed with an unreliable memory, the unconscious, on the contrary, is endowed with an excellent and impeccable memory. It records, to our regret, the smallest events, the smallest facts of our existence. Moreover, it is credulous and accepts, without reasoning, what it is told. And as it is the one that presides over the functioning of all our organs, through the brain, 
the fact that, which will be paradoxical for you, this or that organ works well or badly or, to feel this or that impression, which determines our daily activities, is produced. The unconscious not only presides over the functions of our organism, but also over the fulfillment of all our actions, whatever they may be. What we call, imagination, and which, contrary to what is admitted, always makes us work, even against our will, is the unconscious. Will and Imagination If we open a dictionary, and look up the meaning of the term will, we will find this definition, faculty of freely determining our acts. We accept this definition as true and unimpeachable. Now, nothing is more false, and this will, which we claim so proudly, always gives way to imagination. This is an absolute law, that is to say, it suffers no exception. And to convince yourself, open your eyes, look around you, and understand what you see. You will realize then, that what I tell you, is not a theory founded by a sick brain, but the simple expression of what is. Let us suppose that we place in the sun a plate 10 meters long and 25 meters wide, it is obvious that everyone will be able to go from one side of this plate to the other without stumbling. Let's change the conditions of the experiment and suppose that this plate is placed at the height of the towers of a cathedral, who is then able to advance at least one meter on such a narrow path. Practically no one, no doubt. You would not take two steps without trembling, and that, in spite of all your efforts of will, you would infallibly fall to the ground. Why then, if the board is on the ground, why would you not fall? And why would you fall if it is on the top? Simply because, in the first case, you imagine that it is easy to go to the other end of the plank, whereas, in the second, you imagine that you cannot. You may want to move forward but, if you imagine that you can't, you are left with the absolute impossibility of doing so. If the workers, carpenters, are able to perform such an action, it is because they imagine that they can. Vertigo has no other cause than the image of the fall that we make for ourselves, this image is immediately transformed into an act, in spite of all our efforts of will. These unconscious images are much faster than the intensity of our efforts. Let us think of a person affected by insomnia. If he makes no effort to sleep, he will remain quiet in his bed. If, on the contrary, he wants to sleep, the more effort he makes, the more he trembles, the less he falls asleep. Have you not noticed that, when you think you have forgotten a name, when you try to remember it, it escapes you, whereas, when you substitute in your mind such an idea with this other one, I will remember, the name appears without the slightest effort. Those who ride bicycles remember their first attempts. They were riding down the street and, afraid of falling, they grabbed the steering wheel, and from one moment to the next, they noticed a horse or a simple pebble in the middle of the road, and they tried to avoid the obstacle. But the more effort they made to avoid it, the more directly they went towards it. Who did not have that crazy laugh, that laugh which the more effort they make to avoid it, the more violent it is? What was the thought of each one in such different circumstances? I want not to fall, I want to find the name of, but I can't, I want to avoid the obstacle, but I can't, I want to hold back the laughter, but I can't. As can be seen, in each of these conflicts, it is always the imagination that dominates over the will, without exception. In the same vein, don't we know that a troop leader who rushes forward, at the head of the group, trains his troop to always follow him, while if he shouts, every man for himself, he almost fatally determines failure? Why? In the first case, the troop imagines that it must walk forward, at the head of its troop, while in the second, it imagines that it is defeated, and that it is necessary to flee, to escape death. Panurgus was not ignorant of the contagion of the example, that is, the action of the imagination, when, to revenge himself on a merchant with whom he sailed, he bought the best lamb, and threw it into the sea. So the other lambs followed him, and the enemy had none left. Human beings, we are more or less like lambs and, in spite of ourselves, we irresistibly follow the example of another, imagining that we cannot do otherwise. 
I could cite many examples, but I think such an enumeration is unnecessary. I will not pass over in silence, however, the fact of the enormous power presented by the imagination, that is, the power of the unconscious, in the struggle against the will. There are drinkers who would like to stop drinking, but who cannot prevent themselves from doing so. You can ask them and they will answer you, in all sincerity, that they would like to be sober, that drinking exhausts them, but that they are irresistibly impelled to drink, in spite of their will, in spite of the evil they know it will do them. Even certain criminals, commit their misdeeds in spite of themselves, and when you ask them why, they answer, I could not help it, it was more powerful, it was stronger than me. And the drinker and the criminal tell the truth, they are trained to do what they do, for the sole reason that they imagine they cannot not do it. Thus we, who are so proud of our will, who think we are so free in what we do, are but poor puppets, whose strings our imagination pulls. We will not cease to be such puppets until we have learned to control our imagination. Suggestion and Autosuggestion After the foregoing, we may compare the imagination to a torrent, which finally carries discomfort and which, in spite of our will to cross the river, has let itself fall into it. That torrent seems indomitable, on the other hand, if you know how to take it, you will divert its course, you will lead it to the factory, and there, you will transform it into force, into movement, into heat, into electricity. If this comparison does not seem sufficient to you, let us then compare the imagination to a wild horse, which has neither guide or bridle. What can the rider who mounts it do but let himself be led wherever the horse pleases? And following, then, if he rears up, it is in the ditch that he stops his career. But what if the rider has just put the brakes on his horse and the rolls have changed? It is not the horse that goes where he wants, it is the rider who makes his horse follow the route he wants. Now that we are grasping the enormous force of the unconscious or imaginative being, I will show you that this being, considered as indomitable, can also be tamed as easily as a torrent or a wild horse. But before proceeding further, it is necessary to define carefully, two words that we often use, without knowing with certainty what they mean. These words are, suggestion and autosuggestion. What does suggestion mean? It can be defined as, the action of imposing an idea on the brain of a person. Does this action really exist? Properly speaking, no. Suggestion does not exist by itself. In fact, it does not exist and cannot exist, except on condition, of becoming the subject of autosuggestion. And this word, autosuggestion, we define it as, the implantation of an idea in oneself by oneself. You can suggest something to someone, if the unconscious of the latter does not accept such a suggestion, if he does not digest it, so to speak, to transform it into autosuggestion, it produces no effect. Sometimes, it has happened to me to suggest something banal, to ordinarily obedient subjects, and to see my suggestion fail. The reason for this is that the unconscious of such subjects has refused to accept my suggestion and does not transform it into autosuggestion. Use of autosuggestion I return to the place where I said that we can tame and direct our imagination, as one directs a torrent, or tames a horse. It is enough to know that this is possible, something that almost everybody ignores, and then to know how to make it possible. And well, this way is very simple, it is the one that, without wanting it, without knowing it, in an absolutely unconscious way on our part, we use badly and, for this reason, often of our mother. This mode is the unconscious autosuggestion. Whereas if habitually, one autosuggests unconsciously, it is enough to change, and to autosuggest consciously, and the procedure consists in this. First, to think with one's own reason, the thing to be the object of the autosuggestion. Second, according to the answer yes or no, repeat many times, without thinking of anything else, this will be, or, this happens, or, this happens. Or, this happens, etc. etc. And if the unconscious accepts this suggestion, if it auto-suggests, the desired will be realized, point by point. 
Thus understood, autosuggestion is nothing other than hypnotism as I understand it, and as I define it, by simple conscious autosuggestion. I know that, generally, one passes for a madman in the eyes of the world, when one dares to utter ideas, which most beings are not accustomed to understand. In short, autosuggestion is the influence of the imagination upon the moral and physical being of man. This action is undeniable, and without returning to the preceding examples, I will cite some others. If you persuade yourself that you can do anything, holding that it is possible, you will do it, however difficult it may be. But if, on the contrary, you imagine that you cannot do the simplest thing in the world, it will be impossible for you to do it, and the obstacles will seem to you insurmountable mountains. Such is the case of neurasthenics who, believing themselves incapable of the slightest effort, often find themselves unable to do anything without suffering extreme fatigue. And these same neurasthenics, when they make efforts to get out of their sadness, sink lower and lower. They seem unhappy and collapse and sink deeper and deeper, the more effort they make to save themselves. It is not enough to think that a pain is going away to feel that, in effect, this pain disappears little by little, and inversely, it is enough to think that one suffers to feel immediately, the suffering that arrives. I know certain people who predict, under certain circumstances, that they will have a migraine this or that day and, indeed, on the predicted day, under the given circumstances, they feel it. They provoke the pain themselves as well as others, or they themselves, if they wish, cure themselves. And well, at the risk of passing for a madman, I will say that, if many people are morally and physically ill, it is because they imagine themselves to be ill either morally or physically. If some persons are paralyzed, without any lesion in them, it is because they imagine themselves to be paralyzed, and it is in these persons that extraordinary cures are produced. If some people are happy or unhappy, it is because they imagine themselves to be happy or unhappy, because two people, placed in exactly the same conditions, can find themselves, one perfectly well and the other absolutely bad. Depression, stuttering, phobias, kleptomania, some paralysis, etc., are nothing but the result of the action of the unconscious, on the physical or moral being. But, if our unconscious is the source of many of our evils, it can also produce the cure of our moral and physical affections. It can not only repair the evil it has done, but even cure real diseases, so great is its action on our organism. Lock yourself in a room, sit down on a chair, close your eyes to avoid any distraction, and think only a few moments, if you really auto-suggest it, that is to say, if your unconscious made yours the idea that you offered it, then, you will be surprised to see the thing that you thought about happen. It is necessary to keep in mind that the characteristic of the auto-suggested ideas is to exist, in us, at our expense and, we do not know about them, but for the effects that they produce. But above all, and this recommendation is essential, the will does not intervene in the practice of auto-suggestion, for, if it does not agree with the imagination, that is to say, if you think for example, I want such and such a thing to happen, and the imagination says, you want it, but it is not possible, not only do you not obtain what you want, but you obtain exactly the opposite. This observation is capital, and explains why the results are so unsatisfactory when, in the treatment of the moral affections, we try to re-educate the will. It is in the education of the imagination that one must be attentive, and it is thanks to this nuance that my method has succeeded where others, and not a few, have failed. From numerous experiences, which I have carried out daily for twenty years, and which I have observed with meticulous attention, I have been able to draw the following conclusions, and which I summarize in the form of laws. When the will and the imagination are in struggle, it is always the imagination that wins without exception. In the conflict between the will and the imagination, the strength of the imagination is in direct proportion to the square of the will. When the will and the imagination agree, the one does not add to the other, but the one is multiplied by the other. The imagination can be impelled. The expressions, in direct proportion to the square of the will, and, are multiplied, 
are not rigorously exact. It is simply an image, which is intended to make my thought understood. From what has just been said, it would seem that no one should ever be ill. This is true. Every disease, almost without exception, usually yields to autosuggestion, however bold and implausible my assertion may seem. To bring people to practice conscious autosuggestion, it is necessary to teach how to do it, and it is done as one learns to read and write, or as one teaches music, and so on. Autosuggestion is, as I have said before, an instrument that we bring with us at birth, and with which we play, unconsciously all our lives, just as a baby plays with a rattle. But, it is a dangerous instrument, it can hurt us, and even kill us, if you use it recklessly and unconsciously. On the contrary, it will save us when we know how to use it consciously. You can say about it, the same thing that Aesop said about language, it is the best and, at the same time, the worst thing in the world. Now I will explain to you how you can make everybody feel the beneficial action of auto-suggestion, consciously applied. In saying everybody, I exaggerate a little, for there are two classes of people, in whom it is difficult to provoke conscious auto-suggestion. The retarded who are not capable of understanding what they are told, and people who fail to learn. The way of proceeding, of a subject, to learn the subject for auto-suggestion. The principle of the method is summarized in a few words, you can only think of one thing at a time, that is, two ideas may resemble each other, but not overlap in our thinking. The first idea that occupies our thought, is realized. For it has the tendency to transform itself into an act. Thus, if one comes to think of a sick person that his suffering will disappear, the illness will vanish. If one thinks that a kleptomaniac will not make a mistake again, then he will not do it any more, etc. How to proceed in order to make the suggestion curative? Whatever the affection of the subject, physical or moral, it is necessary to proceed always in the same way, and to pronounce the same words with some variations, according to the cases. Say to the subject, sit down and close your eyes. Do not try to make him sleep, it is useless. I beg you to simply close your eyes, so that your attention is not distracted by objects, which enter your visual field. Now say, all the words that I am going to pronounce, are going to be fixed, printed, engraved, embedded, in his brain. They must be fixed, printed, and embedded. Even if you don't want to, or don't know how, they are going to be fixed, in a totally unconscious way on your part, and your organism and yourself, you must obey. I tell you in principle, every day, three times a day, morning, afternoon and evening. At mealtime, you will be hungry and you will say to yourself, I will eat with pleasure, and indeed, you will eat with pleasure. And indeed, you will eat with pleasure. You will be careful to chew your food slowly, in such a way that you will transform it into a kind of soft paste, which you will digest with pleasure. In these conditions you will digest well, and you will not feel any pain. The assimilation will be done correctly, and your organism will prefer your food to make blood, muscle, strength, energy, in a word, life. As you have digested well, the intestinal function will be fulfilled normally. And every morning when you get up, you will experience the need to evacuate and, without having to use any medication, without resorting to any artifice, you will obtain a satisfactory result. Moreover, every night, from the moment you wish to go to sleep, until the moment you wish to wake up the next morning, you will sleep in a deep, calm, peaceful sleep, during which you will have no nightmares, sleep from which, you will be in a full state of mind. On the other hand, from now on, if it comes to you from being sad, collapsed, fatigued, angry, it will no longer be so, and instead you will be happy. It is possible to be content, without any reason, even happy, just as it was possible to be sad without any reason. I will say more, even if you have real motives and reasons, for which to be bored and afflicted, you will not be bored and afflicted. If moments of impatience or anger come to you, you will not make such movements, you will not have them anymore, on the contrary, 
you will always be patient, always masters of yourselves. And the things that make you angry will become indifferent to you, and you will become calm, very calm. If you are ever assailed by hatreds, which continue with unhealthy ideas, fears, terrors, phobias, temptations and bitterness, I wish that all that, before the eyes of your imagination, will gradually recede from you. And that all that seems to melt away, and get lost as in a distant cloud, in which everything will disappear completely, just as a dream evaporates upon awakening. I wish that all your organs function well, that the heart be beating normally, that the blood circulation be as it should, that the lungs function well, that the stomach, the intestine, the liver, the kidneys, and the bladder, may fulfill their functions normally. If any of them function abnormally, this anomaly disappears day by day, so that in a short time, it will have disappeared completely, and this organ will have resumed its normal function. Also, if there is any injury to any of them, these injuries heal day by day, and will heal quickly. In connection with this, I must say that, it is not necessary to know which organ is diseased, in order to be cured by the influence of autosuggestion. One can repeat to oneself every day, under all points of view, I am going from better to better. And the unconscious will exert its action on that organ, an organ that it will be able to discern very well. Moreover, I add something very important, if up to the present, you have experienced before yourselves, a certain distrust about something, I tell you that this distrust will disappear little by little. Leaving in its place, on the contrary, the confidence in yourselves, based on this force of incalculable power, which is in each one of us. This confidence, is something absolutely indispensable, in every human being. Without self-confidence, you achieve nothing, with self-confidence, you can achieve everything, in the domain of reasonable things, of course. You take confidence in yourself, and then confidence gives you the certainty, that you are capable of doing, not only well, but very well, all the things you wish to do. As long as all those things are reasonable, then you can do them. So, when you decide to do something reasonable, when you have to do a thing that it is your duty to do, always think of that thing as easy. Let the words, difficult, impossible, I cannot, it is stronger than me, I cannot prevent myself from such and such a thing, disappear from your vocabulary. What should be in your vocabulary is, it is easy, I can. If you consider that the thing is easy, it will become easy for you, while to others, it will continue to seem difficult. Thus you will do these things quickly, you will do them well and without fatigue, because you do them without effort. Whereas if you had considered them difficult or impossible, they would become difficult for you, simply because you considered them so. To these general suggestions, which may seem a little long, and even some of them childish, but not for that reason less necessary, we must add those that apply to the particular case of the subject you have in hand. All these suggestions should be made in a monotonous and lulling tone, accentuating the essential words, that invites the subject, if not to sleep, at least to remain calm, to think of nothing. Once the series of suggestions is finished, one addresses the subject, cheerfully, but without emotion, in the following terms, in short, I hope that from all points of view, both from the physical and moral point of view, you will enjoy excellent health, better than you have enjoyed up to now. Now I will count to three, and when I say three, you will open your eyes, and you will come out of the state in which you were, with much peace, and you will not have the least fatigue, nor the least discomfort. On the contrary, you will feel strong, vigorous, willing and full of life, indeed, you will be joyful, very joyful and dominating all your affairs. One, two, three inch. At the word three, the subject opens his eyes and smiles, always with an expression of contentment and well-being on his face. How to practice conscious auto-suggestion. Every morning when you get up, and every evening when you go to bed, close your eyes and, without pretending to fix your attention on what is said to you, pronounce with your lips, loud enough to hear your own words. And counting in a loop provided with twenty knots, say the following sentence, every day, under any point of view, I go better and better. 
The words, under any point of view, are addressed to everything, it is useless to make particular suggestions. This suggestion, in the simplest possible way, even childish and machine-like, and therefore without the least effort, is more effective. In a word, the formula must be repeated, with the tone used to recite the litanies. In this way, it is possible to make this message penetrate in the unconscious, through the ear, and when this message has penetrated, irremediably, it acts. To follow this method all one's life is, at the same time, preventive and curative. In addition, every time that in the course of the day or of the night, you feel a physical or moral suffering, affirm immediately in yourself, that you are going to make it disappear. Then isolate yourself as much as possible, close your eyes, and pass your hand over your forehead if it is something moral, or over the painful part, if it is something physical. Repeat rapidly with the lips, the words, pass, heal, cure, etc., as long as necessary. With a little practice, the moral or physical pain will disappear after 20 to 25 seconds. Start again every time it is necessary. Then it is easy to realize the role of the suggester. He is not a master who orders, he is a friend, a guide, who leads the patient step by step, on his way to healing. As all these suggestions are given in the interest of the patient, the patient's unconscious only demands to assimilate them and transform them into auto-suggestion. When this is done, healing is obtained more or less quickly. The practice of auto-suggestion does not replace medical treatment, but it is a precious aid, both for the patient and for the physician. Chapter 2. The Superiority of the Method. Of course, this method gives absolutely marvelous results, it is easy to understand why. Indeed, doing it as I suggest, there are no failures, ever, except with the two categories of people, of whom I spoke before and who, happily, represent barely 3% of the mass. The test on extremely sensitive subjects, can be done initially without explanations, although such subjects are few in number. Formerly, imagining that suggestion could only be obtained during sleep, I always tried to put my subject to sleep. But having ascertained that this was not indispensable, I stopped doing so, in order to spare him the fear which he almost always experiences, when he is told that he is to be put to sleep. Fear that makes him oppose, in spite of himself, an involuntary resistance to sleep. If, on the contrary, you tell him that you do not want to put him to sleep, because it is totally useless, you will gain his confidence and he will listen to you without fear, without ulterior motives, and often falls asleep, if not at first, at least very quickly. As if lulled to sleep by the monotonous sound of your voice, with a deep sleep, from which he wakes up astonished to have fallen asleep. If there are unbelievers among them, and I am sure there are, I simply say to them, come to my house, see, and you will be convinced by the facts. As I have just said, it is not necessary to believe in order to proceed to employ suggestion, and to determine auto-suggestion. People can be suggested, not only with procedures. And in fact, when they have just been told, that their disease is incurable and that they are going to die, a suggestion has already been provoked in their mind, with disastrous consequences. If, on the contrary, they are told that the disease, even if it is serious, with care, time and patience will be cured, then surprising results can be obtained more frequently. Another example, when a doctor, after examining his patient, writes a prescription and gives it to him without comment, the medicines prescribed will have little chance of success. Whereas if the physician explains to his patient that such and such a drug must be taken in such and such a condition to produce such and such an effect, the advertised results will almost certainly be obtained. If among my readers there are doctors or pharmacists, do not think that I am their enemy, on the contrary, I am their best friend. On the other hand, I would like to see the theoretical and practical study of suggestion included in the curricula of medical schools, for the greater welfare of patients and of the physicians themselves. And on the other hand, I believe that every time a sick person goes to consult a doctor, he should always ask for one or many medicines, 
even if they are not necessary. The sick person, in fact, when he goes to the doctor, goes to get a prescription for the medicine that will cure him. He does not know that, most of the time, it is the hygiene and the regimen that works, to which so little importance is given. It is a medicine that he lacks. In my opinion, if the doctor only prescribes his patient a regimen without any medicine, the patient will be dissatisfied and will say to himself that it was useless to worry, so that he would not be prescribed anything, and he will go to see another doctor. It seems to me then that the physician should always prescribe specialized drugs, for which so much is demanded, and which are often only worthwhile because of the publicity given to them. But they inspire more confidence in the patient than pills, X, or ointments, Y, which are readily available at the pharmacy without a prescription. How does suggestion work? To understand the role of suggestion, or rather auto-suggestion, it is enough to know that the unconscious is the great director of all our functions. Let us make it believe, as I said before, that such an organ that does not work well must work well. It instantly transmits the order to it, and it docilely obeys, its function is normalized, either immediately or little by little. This makes it possible to explain in a simple and clear way, how by suggestion, one can stop hemorrhages, overcome constipation, make fibroids disappear, cure paralysis, cure tubercular lesions, heal varicose wounds, etc. I will take as an example the case of a dental hemorrhage, a case I was able to observe in the office of M. Goth, a dentist in Chihuahua. A young woman, whom I had helped to cure of an asthma, which had lasted eight years after the first outbreak, told me one day that she wanted to have a tooth extracted. As I knew she was very sensitive, I offered to extract it painlessly. Naturally he accepted, not without pleasure, and we made an appointment with the dentist. On the appointed day, we met at the dentist, and in front of her, I told her, you won't feel anything, you won't feel anything, etc. And continuing with my suggestion, I signaled the dentist. A moment later, the dentist got up, without Miss D having blinked. As often happens, a hemorrhage starts. Rather than use any hemostatic, I told the dentist to try the suggestion, not knowing beforehand what would happen. I begged then Miss D, look at me, and I suggested that in two minutes, the bleeding would stop on its own, and we waited. The young lady spat out some bloody saliva, and then nothing, nothing else nothing. I told her to open her mouth, we looked and discovered that a lump of blood had formed in her dental cavity. How to explain such a phenomenon in the simplest way? Under the influence of the idea, the hemorrhage must stop, the unconscious had sent the arterioles and the queens of order not to let the blood escape and, meekly, they contracted in a natural way. Just as they would have done artificially, on contact with a hemostatic such as adrenaline, for example. The same reasoning allows us to understand how a myoma can disappear. The unconscious, having accepted the idea, makes the myoma disappear. The brain orders the arteries that feed it to contract, these contract, refuse their services, and no longer feed the myoma, then this one, deprived of nourishment, dies, falls apart, is reabsorbed and disappears. Use of suggestion, for the cure of affections and moral defects. Depression, so frequent in our days, generally yields to suggestion, regularly practiced in the way I indicate. I had the good fortune to contribute to the cure of a large number of neurasthenics, whom no treatment had helped. One of them even spent a month in a special establishment in Luxembourg without any improvement. In six weeks he was completely cured, and is now a happy man, after having thought himself the unhappiest man in the world. And he never went back to that or any other disease, for I taught him conscious auto-suggestion, and he knows how to practice it wonderfully. But if suggestion is useful in the treatment of the moral and physical affections, what greater service could it render in transforming into honest persons the children who populate the houses of correction, and who only leave them to join the army of crime? Let it not be said to me that this is impossible. It is possible, and I can prove it. I will cite the following two cases, which are characteristic. 
But here I must open a parenthesis. In order that you may understand the way in which suggestion acts in the treatment of moral defects, I will use the following comparison. Let us suppose that our brain is a plate on which points are pressed, representing our ideas, habits, instincts, which determine our actions. If we ascertain that there exists in each individual an absurd idea, a harmful habit, an inadequate instinct, in short, a diseased point. We take an organized idea, a healthy habit, the right instinct, and give it a blow, that is to say, a suggestion. This point will be pressed for a millimeter, let us say, while the old one will cease. At each new suggestive stroke, another millimeter more will be pressed, and the old one will cease another millimeter, so that after a certain number of suggestive strokes, the old point will be substituted by the new one. This substitution operates, the individual obeys it. I return to my examples, young M, was eleven years old and lived in Chihuahua, he was the object, day and night, of certain little accidents inherent to early childhood, he was also a kleptomaniac and a liar by nature. At his mother's request, I gave him suggestion. From the first session, the accident ceased during the day, but continued during the night. Gradually, they became less frequent and finally, a few months later, the little boy was completely cured. At the same time, the passion for stealing diminished and, by the end of the sixth month, he was no longer stealing. This boy's brother, aged 18, had conceived against another of his brothers a violent hatred. Every time he drank a little too much, he felt the impulse to cut his brother with a spoon. He felt that it would happen someday, and at the same time, that after his crime, he would bleed to death on the body of his victim. I also made the suggestion. The result was wonderful. From the first session he was cured, and his hatred for his brother disappeared, and then they were very good friends, trying to collaborate with each other. I followed him for some time, and the healing always persisted. Bringing more than 50% on the most suitable path. When such results are obtained by suggestion, it seems not only useful, but indispensable, to adopt this method and introduce it into houses of correction. I am sure that, with daily and adequate suggestion, applied to vicious children, it would be possible to lead more than 50%, along a less harmful path. Would this not render an immense service to society, by returning safe and sound, many of the future citizens, who would otherwise be injurious to it? It may perhaps be objected to me, that the employment of suggestion is dangerous, and may be used for evil. This objection has no value, in principle, because the practice of suggestion, would be entrusted to serious persons and honest men, to physicians of houses of correction, for instance, and others. Those who intend to make use of it to do harm, ask no one's permission. But even admitting that it offers some danger, which in reality is not possible, I would ask whoever makes this objection, to tell me what we use that does not involve danger. Steam. Electricity. Automobiles. Airplanes. Are not poisons what doctors and pharmacists, we use daily in small doses, and that can tear the sick, if in a moment of carelessness, we are wrong to weigh the grams, of this or that substance, to prepare the medicine. Some cases of healing. This little work would be incomplete without some examples of healing. I will not cite all those in which I have intervened, it would be too long and tiring. I will content myself with citing only a few of the most notable. M. D. of Chihuahua has been suffering for eight years from asthma, which obliges her to spend a great part of the night, sitting up in bed, trying to fill her lungs, which are opposed to their function. Preliminary demonstrations show her very sensitive, immediate sleep, suggestion. From the first day, M. D., achieves an enormous improvement, and spends a good night, interrupted only by an attack of asthma, which lasts a quarter of an hour. After a short time, the asthma disappears completely, with no further relapses. M. M., a tailor worker, inhabitant of St. Sabine, near Trua, has been suffering for two years from lesions at the junction of the spinal column with the pelvis. 
The paralysis exists only in the lower limbs, which are swollen and congested, to the point of taking on a purplish color. Various treatments, including antisyphilitics, have been applied without result. Preliminary explanations, clear, suggestion on my part, auto-suggestion on the part of the subject for eight hours. At the end of this time, there is an appreciable but imperceptible movement of the left leg. New suggestion. Eight hours later, noticeable improvement. From week to week, great improvement, progressive disappearance of the inflammation, etc. At the end of 11 months, the patient goes downstairs, walks 800 meters and, six months later, returns to the workshop where he has been working ever since, with no trace of paralysis. M. G., a resident of Troyes, suffered for a long time from enteritis. Various treatments have failed to cure him. His state of mind is very bad. M. G. is sad, gloomy, unsociable, had suicidal ideas. Preliminary explanations, from the first day of suggestion there was an appreciable result. For three months, daily suggestions at first, then more spaced out. At the end of this time, the cure is complete. The enteritis disappeared completely, and his mood became excellent. As this cure dates back 12 years, with no signs of relapse, it can be considered complete. It is a striking example of the effects that autosuggestion, as well as suggestion, can produce. Whatever he did with autosuggestion, from the physical point of view, he did also from the psychic or moral point of view, with as good results, in one case as in the other. So much so that his confidence in autosuggestion was growing. As he was an excellent worker, he sought to procure the necessary tools in his tailor's trade in order to work at home on behalf of his employer. Some time later, a manufacturer, after seeing him at work, entrusted him with the material he needed. M. G., thanks to his skill, was able to produce more than the average worker. Delighted with such a result, the manufacturer entrusted him with more material and then another and another, and so on. So M. G., who otherwise would have remained a simple workman had he not had recourse to suggestion, now finds himself at the head of six other artisans, procuring good profits. Madame D., of Troyes, aged about 30 years, suffers from the beginnings of tuberculosis, suffers loss of weight daily in spite of overfeeding, cough, oppression, sputum. She seems too ill. However, after suggestion she improves immediately. From the next day, morbid symptoms begin to diminish rapidly. After suggestion, she always has an immediate improvement. The improvement appears day by day, more and more noticeable, the patient's weight increases rapidly, without the need for further overfeeding. After a few months, the cure seems complete. This person wrote to me, eight months after my departure from Troyes, to thank me. She lets me know that she is pregnant, and that she is behaving wonderfully. I have chosen these old cases intentionally, to show that the cure is permanent. I would like to add, however, other more recent cases. M. X., a postal employee in Lunaville, loses a child in January. It triggers cerebral concussion, manifested in him by a nervous tremor. His uncle calls me in June. Preliminary explanations, then suggestion. For days later, the patient returned telling me that his tremor had disappeared. Another suggestion, and an invitation to return eight days later. Then a fortnight, then three weeks, then a month. End of news. Soon after, his uncle arrives and says he has received a letter from his nephew. All is well. He has returned to his job at the post office as a telegraph operator, and has had to leave town. He sends him a letter of 70 words, without the slightest difficulty. He says in his letter that he could have written you a much longer one. Since then, no relapse. M. Y., from Nancy, neurasthenic for many years, phobias, terrors, stomach and intestinal malfunctions, insomnia, gloomy mood and suicidal ideas. When walking he sways as if drunk, 
and thinks continually of his discomfort. No treatment has helped him. His condition worsens, a month's asylum in a special home produces no effect. M. Y. comes to see me. I explain to the patient the mechanisms of autosuggestion, and the existence in us of the conscious being, and of the unconscious being. Suggestion For two or three days, M. Y. remains a little disturbed by the explanations I have given him. After some time, light comes into his mind. He understood. I made the suggestion to him, and taught him to make it to himself, day after day. The improvement, slow at first, becomes more and more rapid, and after a month and a half the cure is complete. The ex-sick man who considered himself the unhappiest of men is now happier. Not only has there been no relapse, but it will be impossible for him to relapse again, for M. Y. is convinced that he is definitely out of that state, and his desire is to spare him any such suffering. M. E. of Chua. Attacked with gout, the joint of the right foot is swollen and painful, it is impossible for him to walk. From the first suggestion, he can reach without the aid of his cane the carriage which will carry him. He no longer suffers. The next day he returns, as I had told him the day before. His wife comes alone, and tells me that her husband got up that morning, put on his shoes, and went to visit his carvings by bicycle, this gentleman was a sculptor and painter. I did not ask any more about this sick man, and he did not have to come back to my house. After a long time I learned that he had not relapsed, but I do not know what else happened. Miss T, from Nancy. Depressed, dyspepsia, gastralgia, enteritis, pains in different parts of the body. Has been treated for many years with negative results. Suggestion by me, daily auto-suggestion by her. Sensible improvement from the first day, without interruption. At present, this person has been cured for a long time, both physically and emotionally. She does not follow any diet. She thinks she still has some enteritis left, but is not sure. Later, the patient comes back, and tells me that his tremor has disappeared. Another suggestion, and an invitation to return eight days later. Then a fortnight, then three weeks, then a month. End of news. Miss X, sister of Miss T, deep depression, remains in bed 15 days a month, unable to move and work, inappetent, sad, digestive system malfunctioning. Cures in a single session. This treatment seems to have lasted a long time, for so far there has not been the slightest relapse. Miss H. de Malzaville. Generalized eczema. Particularly intense on the left leg. Both legs inflamed, especially in the joints of the feet, gait difficult, painful. Suggestion. The same evening, Miss H. can walk several miles without fatigue. The next morning, the feet and joints are swollen and painless. The eczema disappears quickly. Mrs. P. de Lenoveville. Pain in the ankles and knees. The duration of ten years gets worse every day. Suggestion every day on my part, and auto-suggestion on yours. Improvement is immediate and increases progressively. The cure is fast and lasting. Mrs. Z, of Nancy, had a pulmonary congestion, with which she was referred to me two months later. General weakness, inappetence, poor digestion, rare and difficult stools, insomnia, and profuse night sweats. Since the first suggestion, the patient feels much better, and after eight days, she returns, and tells me that she feels completely well. All traces of illness have disappeared, and the organic functions are fulfilled normally. Three or four times she has been on the point of perspiring, but each time she avoids it by the use of conscious auto-suggestion. After that moment, Mrs. Z behaves wonderfully. M. X., a teacher at Belfort, cannot speak for more than ten minutes without becoming completely hoarse. Several doctors consulted, find no lesion in the voice organs. One of them tells him that there is senility of the larynx, 
and this affirmation confirms him in the idea that he will never be cured. He comes to Nancy to spend the vacations. A lady who knew me advises him to come to my office, and he refuses at first. But finally he becomes aware, in spite of his absolute disbelief, of the effects of suggestion. I give him a suggestion, and ask him to come back the next day. He returns the next day, and tells me that he observes that he has talked all afternoon, without becoming hoarse. Two days later he returns, and his aphonia has not reappeared. Some time later, he tells me that his aphonia has not returned. Young B, 13 years old, is admitted to the hospital in January, he suffers from a very serious cardiopathy, characterized by a particular murmur, his breathing is short, and he can only walk with extremely short and slow steps. The examining physician, one of the best clinicians, predicts a rapid and fatal outcome. The patient leaves the hospital in February, not improving. A friend of his family brings him to my house, and when I see how he looks, it makes me think he is lost. However, I give him hope and, after giving him the suggestion and recommending auto-suggestion, I tell him to come back the next day. When I see him again, I find to my great surprise that his breathing and gait have improved markedly. New Suggestion Two days later, when he returns, the improvement has continued, and so it happens in each session. Progress is very rapid, so much so that three weeks after the first session, my little patient goes for a walk with his mother, up to the plateau of Villers, three kilometers. He breathes freely, almost normally, he walks without wheezing and can climb stairs, which until then was impossible for him. The improvement continues day by day, and young B asks me at the end of May if he can go to his grandmother's house in Kerrigan. As I find him well, I advise him to do so. Then he leaves, and gives me news from time to time. His health is getting better and better, he eats with appetite, digests well, assimilates food, even the oppression has completely disappeared. He can not only walk like everyone else, but even run and go butterfly hunting. He comes back in October, and I can hardly recognize him. The small, skinny, stooped man who had left me in May was now a big, straight boy, with a face glowing with health. He gained 12 centimeters in height, and 9 kilos in weight. Since then, he has been living a normal life, going up and down stairs, riding a bicycle, and playing soccer with his classmates. Mrs. X, from Genoa, 13 years old, she has been suffering for a year and a half from a fever of tuberculous origin, according to the opinion of many doctors. The fever resists various medical treatments. She was taken to Mr. Baudouy, a disciple of Dr. Ku, in Genoa. He made the suggestion, and asked to take her to him after eight hours. When she returned, the fever was cured. No relapses. Mrs. Z, also from Genoa, contracture of the left leg for 17 years, followed by an abscess above the knee, due to an operation. The lady asked Mr. Baudouin to make a suggestion, and as soon as she started, her leg bent normally, there was certainly a psychic cause in this case. Mrs. Yu, 55 years old, from Maxville, affected by varicose veins for more than a year and a half. First session in September 1915, second session eight hours later. At the end of 15 days, complete cure. E. C., 10 years old, refugee from Metz, Grand Aru, 19. Unknown affection of the heart, vegetations, blood from the mouth every night. Comes in July. After a few sessions, the blood begins to diminish. The improvement continues day by day, until the end of November, the condition has completely disappeared. The vegetations no longer seem to exist. Mr. H, 48 years old, resident of Bryn. Diagnosed with specific chronic bronchitis, condition worsens day by day. He comes to my office. Immediate and continuous improvement since then. At present, without being completely cured, he is feeling better and better. 
For 24 years, Mr. B had been suffering from frontal sinusitis, for which he had undergone 11 operations, in spite of which the sinusitis persisted, accompanied by intolerable pain. The patient's physical condition was pitiable, violent and almost continuous pain, lack of appetite, extreme weakness, inability to walk, read, sleep, etc. The spirit was not worth much more than the physical state, and in spite of the treatments at Bernheim, in Nancy, at Desjardins, in Paris, at Dubois, in Bern, in Strasbourg. This condition not only persists, but worsens every day. The patient came to me in September, on the advice of one of my clients. From that moment on, the evolution was rapid. Today, ten years later, this gentleman is behaving perfectly. It is a real resurrection. Mr. N, 18 years old, Cellier Street, Potts Disease. His torso has been in a cast for six months. He follows the sessions regularly, twice a week, and does morning and evening, the usual auto-suggestion. The improvement is very rapid, and the patient is able to remove the splint soon after. I saw him again later. He was completely cured and performed the duties of a messenger, then became a nurse in an ambulance at Nancy, where he remained until his retirement. Mr. D, of Jarville, paralysis of the left upper eyelid. He was in the hospital where he had stings, after which the eyelid is held, but the left eye, was more than 45 degrees to the outside. An operation seemed necessary. It is at this time that she returned home and that, thanks to auto-suggestion, her eye gradually returned to its normal position. Mrs. L, in Nancy, interrupted pain on the right side of the face, for more than 10 years. She visits numerous doctors, and applies their prescriptions without any result. An operation is deemed necessary. The patient returns home, has an immediate improvement, and after 10 days, the pain disappears completely. No relapse until December 20th of the same year. Maurice T., eight and a half years old, from Nancy, has Chapin's feet. A first operation cures him, but soon the right foot gets sick. Two new operations, and no result. The child is brought to me the first time in February, he walks quite well, thanks to two devices which control his feet. The first direct session improved him immediately, and after the second, the little one walked with ordinary shoes. The improvement is great. Three years later, the child comes. His right foot is not very strong, because of a fall he has suffered. Miss X, in Blainville, affected left foot probably of specific origin. A slight sprain has caused a swelling of the foot, accompanied by severe pain. Various treatments have had negative results. After some time, she is declared to be affected by a suppuration, which seems to indicate a bone problem. Walking becomes more and more difficult and painful, despite the treatments followed. On the advice of a former patient who had been cured, she came to see me. From the first sessions, there was a marked improvement. Little by little, the swelling is attenuated, the pain becomes less intense, the suppuration is weaker, and finally the healing takes place. This process lasted a few months, now the foot is almost normal, the pain and swelling have completely disappeared, which makes the patient stop. Mrs. R, in Chivigny, illness for 10 years. Comes at the end of July. Immediate improvement, losses and pain decrease rapidly. The following September 29th, she has no more pains and losses. Menstrual flow, which lasted 8 to 10 days, ceases after 4 days. Mrs. G, in Nancy, 40 years old. Affected with varicose veins, treated according to her physician's advice, without success. In the lower leg the affection is enormous, the plaque the length of a 2 franc coin, penetrating to the bone above the ankle, the swelling is intense, the suppuration abundant, and the pains extremely violent. The patient presented for the first time in April. The improvement, which begins to manifest itself from the first session, continues without interruption. 
On February 18, 1917, the leg is completely deflated, the pains and itching have disappeared, the lesion still exists, but it is no longer than a pea, and is not more than 2 or 3 millimeters deep, it continues to suppurate, although slightly. In 1920 the healing is complete. Miss D, at Meyercourt, 16 years old. Nervous crises for three years. These crises, at first infrequent, appear more frequently. When she comes to see me, she had had three crises in the previous fortnight. Until April, no crisis had manifested itself. We can add that this young woman saw the disappearance, from the beginning, of the headaches from which she suffered almost constantly. Mrs. M., 43 years old, Malzaville. She comes for violent headaches, which she has suffered all her life. After a few sessions, the pains disappear completely. After a month, she notes the healing of a uterine descent, of which she had spoken to me, and which she had not thought of when she made her auto-suggestion. This result was due to the words, from all points of view, contained in the formula to be used morning and evening. Mrs. X, Choisy-Leroy. A single general suggestion on my part in July, auto-suggestion on her part, morning and evening. In October of the same year, this lady announces to me that she is cured of a uterine descent, from which she had been suffering for twenty years. Three years later, the cure persists. Mrs. J, sixty years old, Ruda Dominicans. She comes in July because of a violent pain in the right leg, accompanied by a considerable protuberance in the whole leg. She tries to walk and screams. After the session, to his great surprise, he walks normally without feeling the slightest pain. When she returns four days later, the pain has not returned, and the lump has disappeared. This lady tells me that after coming to my house, she was cured of the whitish discharge and of the enteritis, from which she had been suffering for a long time, same observation as above. At the November session, the cure persists. Miss G. L., 15 years old, Rue du Montet. Stutterer since childhood. She comes on July 20th, and sees that her stuttering stops instantly. A month later I see her again, her cure persists. Mr. F., 60 years old, Rue de la Côte. For five years, rheumatic pains in the back, and in the left leg. He walks with difficulty, leaning on a cane, and cannot raise his arms above his shoulders. He comes to see me. After the first session, the pains have completely disappeared, and the patient can not only walk with great strides, but even run. In addition, he can do a claw with both arms. In November, the healing persists. Mr. S., 48 years old, Bougers AUX Dames. He came for the first time, with a varicose plaque on the left leg 15 years old, and as big as a 5 franc piece. Eight days later, the plaque is healed. No relapse. Mrs. L. 63 years old, Chemin Disables. Pain in the face for 10 years. No treatment has been effective and she refuses an operation to be done. She comes to see me, and four days later the pain has disappeared. The healing persists to this day. Mrs. M. Villevier. Menstrual problems for 13 years. Very painful menses on the 22nd or 23rd, lasting 10 to 12 days. First visit in November and returns regularly every week. Significant improvement after the first session. She continues to improve rapidly, and at the beginning of January, the menstrual problems have disappeared, the periods return more or less regularly, and without suffering. A pain I had in my knee for 13 years has also disappeared. Mr. and Mrs. C., inhabitants of Einville. Intermittent rheumatic pain in the right knee, for 11 years. Five years ago more violent crises than usual, the leg swells from time to time, as does the knee, then the lower part atrophies, and the disease reduces her to walking very difficult, with the help of a cane, and the support of someone. 
she comes for the first time in December. She walks without a cane. Then she no longer uses the support, although sometimes she does use the cane. Sometimes her knee hurts, but it is very mild. Chapter 3 What conclusion can be drawn from all this? The conclusion is simple, and can be expressed in a few words. We possess in us, a powerful and incalculable force that, when we manage it unconsciously, can sometimes harm us. On the contrary, if we direct it wisely and consciously, it will give us control over ourselves, and allow us not only to help ourselves out of certain difficulties, but also to help others who are ill, physically, or morally. But better still to live relatively happily, whatever the conditions in which we find ourselves. Finally, this force, if well applied, can help the moral regeneration of those who have strayed from the right path. Education as it should be. Something that may seem paradoxical at first, is that the education of the child should begin before its birth. Indeed, if a woman has been pregnant for a few weeks, she has in her mind the idea that her child will bring into the world physical and moral qualities such as she would wish to have had. And if she continues, during the time of gestation, to make herself the same image, the child will probably have such qualities. Spartan women bore only sturdy sons, who later became fearsome warriors, because their greatest desire was to give such men to the country, while in Athens, women bore intellectual sons, whose qualities of thought mattered a hundred times more than physical qualities. The child thus procreated will then be able to easily accept the suggestions made to him and transform them into the auto-suggestion that will later determine the behavior he will present in his life. For it is necessary to know that all our words, all our acts, are but the result of auto-suggestions provoked, most of the time, by the suggestion of the example and of the words. What should fathers and mothers do, then, in order not to provoke in their children harmful auto-suggestions, and to give birth in them to the correct ones? To be always with them, in good humor, to speak to them in a sweet tone, but nevertheless, clear and serious. Thus induce them to obey, without them even being tempted to resist. Above all, avoid brutalizing them, because you run the risk of causing them to have an auto-suggestion of fear, accompanied by hatred. Avoid also, to say in front of them what is bad of other people, as it is often done in the classrooms where, without thinking about it, one destroys with words a good absent friend. Children fatally underline such an example, and could later cause real catastrophes. Awaken in children, the desire to know the things of nature, and to be interested in them, giving them clear explanations, using as much as possible a kind tone, and in a good mood. Consequently, answer their questions with complacency, instead of telling them, you bore me, leave me alone, or, I'll explain it to you later. Or, I'll explain later. Under no pretext ever say to a child, you're just a bum, you're good for nothing, etc. Because this would create difficulties in them, which they will later reproach themselves for. If a child is lazy and does his homework badly, you have to tell him one day, even if it is not true, ah, today you have done your homework better than usual, that's good, my little one. The child, flattered by such praise, to which he is not accustomed, will undoubtedly work much better the next time, and little by little, thanks to the encouragement given with discernment, he will really get to work as well as he wishes. Avoid, at all costs, talking about illnesses in front of the children, a fact that could determine them. On the contrary, speak of health as something normal in man, and that illness is an anomaly, a kind of discomfort, which can be avoided by living in a sober and orderly way. Do not create difficulties in children, teaching them to fear this or that, the cold, the heat, the rain, the wind, and so on. Man is made to bear all this without effect. Without suffering or complaining. It is not necessary to distress the child, speaking to him of the bogeyman, of the werewolves, because the fear contracted in childhood, has the risk of persisting later. For this reason, those who do not raise their children themselves, should choose people they trust for this task. It is not enough that they love the children, 
but they must have qualities that awaken in them the right desires and reinforce those that they themselves forge. To awaken in the children the love of work and study, making them accessible to them and explaining to them, as I have just said, things clearly and in a pleasant way, introducing in the explanations some witty anecdote, which provokes in the child the desire for the following lessons. To instill in them above all, that work is indispensable to man, that he who does not work at something is useless, that all work brings to the one who does it, healthy and deep satisfactions. While the idol, so dreamed of by some, becomes dull, depressed and without taste for life, leading him to failure and crime, because he does not have the means to satisfy the passions created by idleness. To teach children to be respectful and kind to all, and more particularly to those who, by chance of birth, are placed in classes inferior to their own, to respect the elderly, and not to make fun of the physical or moral defects, which sometimes afflict the old. To teach them that one can love people, without distinction of social position, that one must be ready to help the needy, and not be afraid to waste time or money in collaborating, that one must care for others, as if it were for oneself. In short, to try to experience, without seeking it, an intimate satisfaction, which the selfish person seeks but never finds. To develop self-confidence in children, teaching them that, before doing something, they must submit it to the control of reason, avoiding acting impulsively, and that, after having reasoned, they must make a decision on which they will not go back, unless they have the proof that they have made a mistake. To teach them above all, that each one must set out in life with the idea, very precise, of where he wants to arrive, and that, under the influence of this idea, he will arrive, not that he must wait calmly for events, not that because he has formulated such an idea, he will know what to do to achieve it. And he will know how to choose the occasions, or even the only occasion, that will pass his way. While the one who doubts himself, is the constant metatropa, to whom nothing goes well. He can swim in an ocean of crazy ideas, and he will not find the way to achieve even one of them, because he will always choose the occasions that will make him fail. While he who has in himself the idea of success will give birth, sometimes unconsciously, to the events that will lead him to success. But, above all, parents and teachers must set an example. Children are extremely suggestive. Whatever they see them do, they do, that is why parents are obliged to set a good example to their children. As soon as children learn to speak, make them repeat morning and evening, twenty times in succession, the phrase, every day, from all points of view, I go from better to better, which will procure them an excellent physical and moral health. It helps the child powerfully, to make his difficulties disappear, and to develop the qualities to which he was opposed, by suggesting to him the following, every night, in the dark, approach the child's bed during his first sleep, the deepest. Stay one meter away from his head, and in a low voice so as not to wake him up, in a kind of murmur, start suggesting him the dream, repeating slowly five or six times, you sleep from better to better. Then, passing to the suggestion itself, name for his unconscious, the physical or moral improvement that you wish to obtain, taking care to use only positive formulas. Do not make at first but one or two suggestions in succession, repeating them about twenty times, not passing on to others, until you observe the results acquired, normally, with the first ones. Examples of Suggestions 1. For the mental, to a lazy, fearful or lying child, do not say, you are lazy, fearful or lying, tell him, you are lazy, fearful or lying. Say to him, you are becoming hardworking, industrious, lively, more and more frank and sincere. 2. For the physique, you have an appetite, your digestion is better, your lungs are fortified, you become strong and you progress in your development. 3. For urinary incontinence, use words that the child can understand according to his age. a. To a toddler, you call mommy, and your potty will be right next to you, clean. b. To an older child, you can hold it all night now, and your bed will always be dry and clean. If the child wakes up while being spoken to, 
stop immediately, it is better to start again the next day. The unconscious will continue to function after the words received, and parents will be surprised at the results that can be obtained with this extremely simple procedure. It is easy to understand the reason. When the child sleeps, his body and his conscious being, at rest, are, so to speak, annulled, but his unconscious being keeps watch. It is the latter that is called upon, and, being very credulous, he accepts what he is told, without discussion, and little by little the child comes to realize by himself, what the parents wish. But above all proceed with regularity, patience and perseverance, the results are rarely spontaneous. Warning. During the day, do not talk to the child, or in front of him, about what you do while he sleeps. Finally, it would be desirable that every morning, teachers direct their pupils to suggestion, as follows. After making them close their eyes, they will say to them, My friends, I hope that you are respectful children, kind to the people who surround you, and obedient to the instructions, which are given to you by your parents and teachers, and that when they give you an order, you are attentive to the instructions, and take them into account when executing them. Sometimes you get angry when they give you an order, but now, you will understand, you will understand that these orders, are for your protection and benefit. Therefore, when you receive them, you will recognize in that person your desire to serve you, and not to bother you. When they grow up they will like to work, whatever the trade. Now that they are studying, then they will like to study, and the things they should study, even if they have been boring at other times. Then, when you are in class and the teacher gives you lessons, you will have your attention fixed only on what he tells you, without worrying about what your companions do or say, and above all, without you saying or doing anything else, other than studying. In these conditions, as you are intelligent, because you are, my friends, you will easily understand and memorize the things you have learned. These things are stored in a place in your memory, where they will be at your disposal, and from where you will draw them, when you have need of them. In the same way, when you work alone, whether at school or at home, when you do your homework or whatever you have to study, you will have your attention solely, exclusively on the work you are doing, and you will always, in this way, obtain good results. Such are the counsels which, well followed, will give children better dispositions, as to physical and moral qualities.